Hey everyone, welcome to another lecture. Today it's going to be disorders of the pleura medius tinum and chest wall. Um, the objectives are to briefly review the pertinent clinical anatomy um, above and below the diaphragm and to get a deeper understanding of the major structures around this area and the chest wall and what are the things that are commonly seen in emergency medical practice. Now the common disorders or the major disorders include the masses, mediastinitis, costochondritis, effusions and empyma, pleurisy, um, pneumothorax. So these are the common things that you see in the emergency department. I'm going to go briefly on all of them one by one. But first the anatomy. So pleura is, as we know, is the membranous covering of the lungs and the chest wall. It's got a parietal pleura and a visceral pleura, so two components. Uh, it's got a rich network of lymphatics and the capillaries. In the visceral pleura, it lines the surface of the lungs. So viscera is an organ, so that's why it's called a visceral pleura, because it lines the surface of the lungs. It does not have any sensory nerves. The parietal pleura, on the other hand, it lines the surface of the chest wall, diaphragm and mediastinum. Okay, so visceral pleura lines the surface of the lungs, parietal pleura lines the surface of the chest wall, diaphragm and mediastinum. Sensory nerve endings has got sharp localizable pain increase with inspiration. Central diaphragmatic pleura is innervated with the phrenic nerve and it causes referred pain to the shoulder. The pleural space is the scanty amount of fluid that's present between the parietal and the visceral pleura. It moves, increases and decreases due to hydrostatic, osmotic and interpleural forces. Now this is negative which allows the lung to stay expanded. If it becomes positive due to air or fluid like in pneumothorax or hydropneumothorax or hydrothorax or hemothorax, lungs cannot expand and they collapse. So abnormal air in this space is pneumothorax, abnormal blood is hemothorax, abnormal liquid is pleural effusion, which can be transudate, which is non-infective, like in ascites or liver failure, or exudate, which can be, which is the infected version of the liquid. Okay, so costochondritis. What is costochondritis? Now it is an inflammation of the anterior costal cartilages involving the costochondral or sternochondral joints. Uh, it can again be in septic or an aseptic costochondritis. Now, the important things regarding costochondritis is that it is avascular. The costochondral cartilage is avascular. It's nourished by vascular supply in a tightly adherent perichondrium. The avascular nature of the cartilage makes treating septic costochondritis difficult. Invaded cartilage acts as a foreign body because it's avascular. If you give antibiotics, they're not going to reach the cartilage because it's avascular. So how do you treat it? That, that becomes a consideration that becomes an important risk factor. Now, why does it happen? Uh, now, the causes are obviously defined as septic or aseptic. Septic is usually because of surgical processes involving the chest wall. So any surgery around that area, like a median sternotomy, which is the most common cause for a septic costochondritis or a hematogenous seeding in IV drug abusers. Blunt trauma to the perichondrium can also result in seeding from another source. Whereas aseptic doesn't have any established risk factors and the etiology is unknown. The synonyms for this condition are anterior chest wall syndrome, costosternal syndrome, chest wall syndrome, costosternal chondrodynia or Tietz syndrome. Tietz was first described in 1921 by the German surgeon Alexander Tietz. It's because of a specific inflammation of the first two to three costochondral articulations. It presents as a localized or a diffuse form. Pain may be aching, sharp, dull, constant, or only with the movement. Pain severity is from minor irritation to escalating pain with autonomic symptoms. Physical exam should reveal tenderness over the costosternal or costochondral junctions or cartilage. If there is sweating, septic etiology is most common. Crowning roost maneuver and horizontal arm flexion tests are used to diagnose. Okay, so aseptic costochondritis is a clinical diagnosis. There are no lab or imaging tests which are specific. 
septic costochondritis is best defined with nuclear medicine studies. Clinical judgment dictates a need to perform X-ray, ECG, and other heart-specific and lung-specific testing. So you're basically trying to rule out other conditions. Some of these conditions that you need to rule out are muscular, like overuse syndromes, or osseous, like tumors or sickle cell anemia infections, articular, like sternoclavicular or costovertebral joint problems. Then you can have neurological, like herpes zoster or a herniated disc vascular like in a Mondor syndrome or lymphatic and subcutaneous conditions. These are the conditions depending on how the patient presents, what are your examination findings you need to rule out. Some of the other things that may mimic this problem are gastrointestinal esophageal spasm, esophagitis, gastroesophageal reflux or gastritis, then cardiac conditions like myocardial ischemia, other intrathoracic abnormalities like pulmonary embolus, pleurisy, pneumonia, pericarditis and atraumatic spontaneous pneumothorax. So these are some of the conditions that you need to rule out when uh, you're considering these uh, osteochondritis. Now treatment again um, is any inflammatory articulation is by rest, heat, anti-inflammatory and analgesic medication. So this is the simple way to treat osteochondritis. Now next thing is mediastinitis. First, what are the important things to know about mediastinitis? It is an acute suppurative mediastinitis. Um, it is a rapidly progressive infection which has a high mortality rate. Before we had modern day antibiotics, mortality was up to 50%, but which has only come down to 40% in the last 60 years. So you need to think of it as a high mortality, as a high risk condition. Got to be very, very careful um, not to miss a mediastinitis. Uh, the patient can die. Now the lethality, why do patients die so much is due to rapid spread and development of fulmin and sepsis. Why does it happen is because of an esophageal perforation, upper respiratory tract infection, odontogenic infections, trauma and procedures in the airway, neck and the chest and the impacted foreign bodies. Microbiologies are usually polymicrobial with aerobes and anaerobes. How does a patient present? So the initial symptoms are often very subtle. Fever, dyspnea, cough, chest pain, abdominal pain and back pain are the common presentations. Physical findings can be variable. It on the face, arm, neck and chest. With progression possibly it can have pericardial effusion or tracheobronchial compressions. Further complications include empyema, aortic erosions, aspiration pneumonia, coastal osteomyelitis. Terminal complications are hypotension, shock, mental confusion, obtundation, renal failure, cardiovascular collapse. So how do you manage these? High index of suspicion, widen mediastinum on the chest x-ray, so enlarged cardiac silhute, gas in soft tissues, air fluid levels. If the diagnosis is unclear, you can do a CT, ultrasound, gastrograph and swallow, thoracentesis or pericardiosynthesis. Treatment is by early surgical consultation. Treatment is individualized, including surgical debridement, antibiotics, and hemodynamic support of sepsis and shock. Okay, next is mediastinal masses. So clinical presentation, two thirds of the patients are asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. Those who are symptomatic most often have malignancy. Symptoms extremely variable depending upon the location cough, dyspnea, dysphagia, chest pain, superior vena cava syndrome. Masses that originate uh, can be in the anterior compartment, like thymomas and thymic related neoplasms, lymphomas, germ cell tumors, cysts, endocrine tumors of the thyroid or the parathyroid, mesenchymal tumors and primary carcinomas. Masses that originate in the mediastinal compartment can be lymphomas, cysts, mesenchymal tumors, carcinomas, or in the posterior compartment can be neurogenic tumors, cysts, mesenchymal tumors, or esophageal neoplasms. Then we come to spontaneous pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is a free air in intrapleural space. Spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in the absence of any precipitating factors, traumatic or iatrogenic. Primary spontaneous pneumothorax is no clinically apparent lung disease, underlying pulmonary disease. 
primary spontaneous pneumothorax, 15 per 100,000 year for men, 5 per 100,000 year for women. Generally, young men of taller than average height. Cigarette smoking and changes in the ambient pressure as associated factors. Marfan syndrome and mitral valve prolapse have higher frequency. They are unrelated to physical exertion. Now, they can be a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, which is one third of all the pneumothoraces. Incidence is three times higher in men. Higher association with COPD occurs in 2% of patients with HIV or AIDS and generally in the setting of pneumocystis carinae pneumonia. In any patient with cancer, pulmonary metastasis is likely. Some of the causes include airway disease like COPD, asthma and cystic fibrosis. Infections like necrotizing bacterial pneumonia or lung abscesses, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, tuberculosis, interstitial lung disease like sarcoidosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, lymphangematosis, tuberous sclerosis, and pneumoconiosis. Then cancers like primary lung cancers or pleural metastasis, miscellaneous like connective tissue diseases, pulmonary infarctions, endometriosis. Okay, so what is catamenial pneumothorax? It's rarely seen, but hypothesized pathophysiology is groovy. Recurrent spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in association with menses. So that's what a catamenial pneumothorax is. It's also known as thoracic, thoracic endometriosis syndrome. Exact etiology is unknown, but often responds to ovulation suppressing medications. Principles are interpleural pressure is negative with inspiration and negative with expiration. Interbronchial and intraalveolar pressures are negative with inspiration and positive with expiration. Any defect causes air to enter the pleural space until pressure equalizes or a defect seals. Principles with loss of negative interpleural pressure, ipsilateral lungs collapse, restrictive ventilatory impairment reduced. Vital capacity, force residual capacity, functional residual capacity, and total lung volume. There's a ventilation perfusion mismatch which leads to hypoxemia. Now, with tension pneumothorax, pleural defect is a one way valve. Positive interpleural pressure leads to compression of the contralateral lung with worsening hypoxia. Pressures exceeding 15 to 20 millimeters mercury impair venous return and cause cardiovascular collapse and death. So primary spontaneous pneumothorax is a rupture of a bleb, so pleural bulla disrupts the alveolar pleural barrier. Etiology of a bulla felt to be due to degradation of elastic fibers in the lung. A secondary spontaneous pneumothorax is usually due to an underlying lung disease which weakens the alveolar pleural barrier. So clinical features are chest pain and dyspnea. Symptoms generally begin suddenly and while at rest. Pain worsens with inspiration. This mild dyspnea but extreme dyspnea is uncommon. General findings include physical findings correlating the degree of symptoms and signs, mild sinus tachycardia, decrease or absence of breath sounds, hyperresonance to percussion, unilateral enlargement of the hemithorax, decreased excursions with respiration, absent tactile fremitus, inferior displacement of the liver or the spleen. Important thing to note is absence of all or any of these does not exclude pneumothorax. For tension pneumothorax, you have signs. Now, pneumothorax with lung disease due to poor pulmonary reserve, dyspnea is almost universal. Physical findings include hyperexpansion, distant breath sounds, overlap with underlying lung disease. Clinical diagnosis is difficult. Pneumothorax should be considered whenever a COPD patient presents with an exacerbation of dyspnea. Classic X-ray findings. Diagnosis is generally made via chest X-ray. You've got a thin visceral pleural line parallel to the chest wall, separated by a radiolucent and devoid of lung tissue. Average width of the band can be used to estimate the size, but best to characterize as small, moderate, large, or total. Size is important in managing the decisions in the treatment. Additional issues, attention pneumothorax. Clinical diagnosis should not delay treatment to pursue x-rays. If a diagnosis not suspected clinically, 
X-rays show complete lung collapse, distension of the thoracic cavity and shift of mediastinal structures. Now when a pneumothorax suspected but is not seen on the X-ray, you could do expiratory films. Volumes of the lungs are reduced with expiration and relative size of the pneumothorax is increased. It may identify apical pneumothorax. Lateral decubitus films may show small amount of intrapleural air along the lateral chest border. Now when underlying lung diseases exist, paucity of lung markings makes diagnosis difficult. Giant bullae can stimulate pneumothorax. Pneumothorax runs parallel to the chest wall and thoracic CT may be of significant value. Differentials include pulmonary embolism, pleural irritation from other causes, and a myocardial infarction. Now all these can be diagnosed based on the history and the investigations and something like a myocardial infarction, obviously you could uh, do an ECG and see the characteristic changes. The next is spontaneous pneumomediastinum. Differentials by finding of mediastinal air on chest X-ray and presence of subcutaneous emphysema. Primary spontaneous pneumomediastinum is often with exertion following a valsalva maneuver, generally in the absence of lung disease, generally a benign cause. Secondary causes include treatment aimed at underlying disorder, example Bohove syndrome. Spontaneous hemoneumothorax is rare but potentially serious. Lung collapse is associated with rupture of the vessel in the pritoperial adhesion. It may present as a hemorrhagic shock. Treatment is with a large caliber tube thoracostomy. Management for, for, management for tension pneumothorax is, this is one of our true emergencies where rapid recognition and treatment it can really, really make a difference. Now conditions worsen with each passing moment and each additional breath. Do not delay treating for an X-ray. Decompress immediately when the needle or tube depends upon your skill sets. Needle thoracostomy is not def definitive. All this needs to be followed by a tube thoracostomy. There are two primary goals, to evacuate air from the pleural space and to prevent recurrence. And treatments need to be individualized based upon size, presence of underlying disease, other comorbidities, history of previous pneumothoraces, patient reliability, persistence of air leak, patient reliability for follow-up. Management in young healthy patients with small primary pneumothorax less than 20% can be observation. Reabsorption rate is usually 1 to 2% per day. Uh, rate is accelerated with oxygen. Admit for 6 hours observation. Discharge if it doesn't increase in 6 hours. And good discharge instructions are very, very important. Now, if, what if it's more than 20%? Then IV catheter aspiration or chest tube drainage is important. IV catheter, low mobility and cost savings, lack of invasiveness. Success rate is only about up to 70%. Observe for six hours and discharge. If there's failure, may attach catheter to water seal device. Okay, so tube thoracostomy is widely used as a treatment of choice in many circumstances. It's indicated for large primary spontaneous pneumothoraces, secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces, all of the tension pneumothoraces, and all patients likely to need ventilation. So the tubes for primary spontaneous pneumothoraces are 7 to 14, secondary is 20 to 28, and if there's pleural fluid or need for mechanical ventilation, can be greater than 28. After Insertion attached to the water seal device. It's left in place until the lung expanded and air leak is seized. Hemolytic wall may be used. Application of suction is no longer recommended after standard tube thoracostomy. It does not increase rate of lung re-expansion nor improves the outcome. Suction 27 mm of water used if lung develops no re-expansion in 24 to 48 hours. Primary spontaneous pneumothoraces you should resolve in seven days. Air leak longer than two days is less likely to resolve and air leak longer than four to seven days generally needs surgery. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, failure of tube thoracostomy more common due to disease leading to large air leak. Recon rates for primary is up to 30%, for secondary 50% and is increased with younger age, low weight to height ratio and smoking. Okay, so what 
if the pneumothorax recurs. Preventive treatment is indicated if recurrence could be life-threatening or if the patient continues in risk activities. Intervention types include pleurodesis with sclerosing agents or pleural abrasion or reception of the apical bullet. Pleural inflammation and infusion. Okay, so pleural infusion. Let's have a look at what is pleural infusion. So as the name suggests, it's an abnormally large amount of fluid in the pleural space. It's most common in Western countries. Most common worldwide is tuberculosis. Other causes include uremia, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, intra-abdominal processes. It can be both transudate and exudate. So transudate is an aseptic version and exudate when it's an infective cause. Also need to know about paranemonic effusion as the name suggests it's associated with the pneumonia. Pleuritis is the inflammation of the pleura. Complicated paranemonic effusion with a paranemonic effusion which requires chest tube for resolution. Loculated when there are adhesions in the pleural space. Empyema when there's pus in the pleural space. Principles that pleural fluid produced from systemic capillaries at parietal pleura are absorbed into pulmonary capillaries at visceral pleura. Fluid is governed by Starling's law, difference between hydrostatic pressures of the systemic and pulmonary circulations. When influx exceeds outflux, effusion develops. Effusions may be transudate or exudate. Transudatives are ultrafilters of plasma with little protein, decreased to increase in hydrostatic pressure. Main cause is heart failure in about 90% of the patients. Cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome are remaining primary causes, although also have hyperproteinemia. Okay, so exudative contain high amounts of protein and they reflect an abnormality of the pleura itself. Any pulmonary or pleural process may result in an exudate. Paranemonic effusion is the most common cause of an exudative pleural effusion. Massive effusions are generally due to malignancy. Causes of pleural effusions, uh, numbered transudates, heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, hypoalbuminemia, mixed edema, peritoneal dialysis, glomerulonephritis, superior vena cava obstruction, and pulmonary embolism. Causes of pleural effusion, as in exudative, is bacterial pneumonias, bronchiectasis, lung abscesses, tuberculosis, viral infections, neoplasms, mesotheliomas, lung cancers, pulmonary metastasis, and lymphomas. Connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid and SLE can also cause an exudative effusion. Then some GI disorders like pancreatitis, subphrenic abscesses, esophageal rupture, abdominal surgery can also cause exudative. Miscellaneous include pulmonary infarction, uremia, drug reactions, postpartum, chylothorax. Okay, so clinical features. History often indicates a diagnosis. Symptoms are most often due to underlying disease processes. Small pleural effusions are often asymptomatic. Knee effusion, often localized pain or refer to the shoulder. Large effusion causes dyspnea on exertion or rest. Acute pleuritic pain, think of pleurisy or pulmonary infarction. Clinical features also depend on the size of effusion, often dominated or obscured by the underlying disease process. Classical findings include decreased breath sounds, dullness to percussion, decreased tactile fremites, and sometimes a localized pleural friction rub. With massive effusions, you may see signs of a mediastinal shift. X-ray, you see the blunting of the costophrenic angle, which is a classic finding. 250 mils of fluid is necessary to visualize on AP or PHS X-ray. If it's less than 250, you can do a lateral upright x-ray. If it's more than 500, you have an obscured hemidiaphragm. Massive effusion, you have a total hemithoracic opacification. So recumbent patients, pleural fluid gravitates superiorly, laterally, and posteriorly. Large effusion may show diffuse haziness. Cross table lateral in supine position, see a posterior layering of the effusion. Lateral decubitus is better for detection of small effusions. Lateral decubitus 
with slight trendle work can show as little as 5 to 15 milliliters pleural fluid. So management it centers on the treatment of the underlying disease processes. Circulatory or respiratory compromise is a priority and treat serious conditions without a delay. NSAs for pleural pain, opiates are safe and effective, but got to be cautious in elderly. Thoracentesis in the ED is diagnostic or therapeutic. This needs to be an individual decision. In general, it's unless it's urgently needed for stabilization of the patient, respiratory or circulatory status, it's best deferred until the patient is admitted. So therapeutic synthesis is to promote urgently needed cardiorespiratory and hemodynamic stability. Diagnostic is to sort out potentially life-threatening circumstances in the toxic patient. And palliative is symptomatic relief. Contraindications for thoracentesis should include coagulopathy and bleeding disorders and pleural adhesion due to prior history of empyema and have a high risk of pneumothorax. It can cause complications which can be iatrogenic pneumothorax, hemothorax, lung laceration, shearing of the catheter tip, infection, transient hypoxia due to ventricular perfusion mismatch, post-expansion pulmonary edema and hypotension. So pleural fluid analysis, the primary goal is to distinguish between a transudate and exudate. Transudate directs attention to the underlying causes like a heart failure, renal failure or liver failure. Exudate needs further evaluation. The things to see are pH, protein, LDH, glucose, cell count, gram stain, and culture. Light's criteria is 98% sensitivity for a diagnosis of exudative effusion. So, Light's criteria is to distinguish exudate from the transudate. So, if it's, it's considered an exudate if the pleural fluid protein to the serum protein is more than 0.5, pleural fluid LDH to serum LDH is more than 0.6, pleural fluid LDH is more than two thirds of the upper normal serum LDH. So this is a light criteria. If these criteria are satisfied, then it is an exudate or it is because of an infective process, not in transudate. Acidosis is a marker of severe pleural inflammation. Less than 7.3 pH is associated with effusions, malignancies, rheumatoid arthritis, TB, and systemic acidosis. Less than 7 strongly suggests empyema. Of 7 often exists with low glucose and high LDH. There's very high probability of empyema and tube thoracostomy is indicated. What if it's a bloody effusion? It could be a trauma, neoplasm, or an infarction. You should obtain the hematocrit on the fluid, and if it's greater than 50%, then it's a hemothorax. In the absence of trauma, it usually indicates spontaneous rupture of tumor or the blood vessels. The tube thoracostomy is indicated, and if the bleeding is more than 200 milliliters per hour, thoracotomy is indicated. Cell count, normal fluid is less than 1,000 white blood cells. Exudate, more than 10,000 white blood cells. So neutrophil predominant is an acute process, as in pneumonia, embolism, and TB. Monocyte or lymphocyte predominance is in a chronic process, malignancy, or chronic TB. Other things to do are amylase, which is elevated in pancreatitis or esophageal rupture. Bacterial antigen testing may be done on paranemonic effusion. Cytology is needed for evaluation of malignancy. Key concepts are for a healthy young patient with a small, less than 20% primary spontaneous pneumothorax, observation is sufficient. For larger symptomatic pneumothoraces, simple aspiration with an IV catheter is usually successful. Now, in most cases of secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, Tube thoracostomy should be considered because less invasive approaches are associated with lower rates of success. Application of suction after routine tube thoracostomy is no longer recommended and does not accelerate the lung re-expansion. The most common cause of pleural effusion in Western countries is congestive heart failure followed by malignancy in bacterial pneumonia. However, the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism should not be overlooked with a pleural effusion of uncertain diagnosis. 
Therapeutic thoracentesis is indicated for the relief of acute respiratory or cardiovascular compromise. The clearest indication for diagnostic thoracentesis in the emergency department is to diagnose immediate life-threatening conditions such as empyema, esophageal rupture in a toxic patient. In most other causes, diagnostic thoracentesis is to distinguish between transudative and exudative process and can be deferred to the inpatient unit. We hope, that, hope you like our video. Do not forget to leave a comment and share the video. Do subscribe to the channel.